Well, good morning, and thank you uh, for showing up this morning after uh, a late night and too much food and uh, too much celebration. Uh, it was a fascinating day yesterday. I was asked to give a recap of the discussion yesterday, and I, I frankly find that it would be difficult to do a, a recap without a redo, because I think there was so much information that came out in so many different aspects. But I'll, I'll give it a quick attempt to, uh, to put it into a few categories. Uh, first off, uh, as we discussed a lot yesterday, uh, clearly there's a lot of opportunity in the region and yet a lot of obstacles to realizing this opportunity at the same time, and these can be tackled. Uh, the second is that you look at this at different levels. There's the level of entrepreneurship and business development in each of the countries of the region. There's a level of cooperation within the region to create a larger and more attractive market. And then there's the level of attracting the foreign investment and engaging in the foreign trade that's going to create the uh, additional connections to a global economy and the prospects for really rising prosperity as part of uh, a much wider uh, environment than just Southeast Europe itself. And all of those have their own challenges. All of those, however, uh, are understood, I think, both by businesses in the region and, as we heard from the, the government ministers as well. And the question comes down really to one of execution. Do we have the right vision? And then do we follow through systematically to make sure that progress moves along those lines? And that's perhaps a good introduction to our speaker this morning, um, a man who needs little introduction here in Dubrovnik. Uh, Robert Ben Moshe, he is the chairman of AIG Group, and uh, as anyone who follows U.S. politics and finance closely, that's one heck of a job right now. <laughs> um, he spent a career uh, at MetLife, retired from there in 2006. Prior to that, had worked on Wall Street. So we have a rare opportunity, really, to hear from someone who has seen and participated in the financial and business development in the United States over a couple of decades and had a rare opportunity to see what works and see what doesn't work, himself ending up in an extraordinarily successful career, uh, being brought back in uh, with AIG, and hopefully he can give us a perspective for a country such as Croatia or a region such as Southeastern Europe, uh, draw a few lessons from that experience and looking ahead for the future prosperity of this region. So without any further introduction, let me invite uh, Mr. Ben Moshe to take the, take the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Good, good morning, everybody. I guess, uh, I guess I'm your uh, wake-up call. <laughs> so I appreciate you getting up so early in the morning on a beautiful day. Uh, and by the way, this is a special day. Um, this is the day after Bura. And so if you're ever in Dubrovnik and you want to take pictures, if you look outside, this is the this is the time to do it. So uh, it, it's a little cool, but it's a warm and wonderful place. Uh, I was asked to talk with all of you about um, my experiences, but, but the biggest question uh, uh, that people thought I could answer for all of you is why would I ever come to Croatia? And why would I ever buy a home here in Dubrovnik? And, and what, what drove me to do that? And uh, now that you've been here, you understand. Probably before you got here, you did not understand. Uh, it's a beautiful place in the world, but it came with some challenges. And so I never thought of myself as a pioneer. Uh, to me, I was somebody who, uh, I, I came here in 1987 on an incentive trip. We put together a trip, uh, and I used to like to teach our stockbrokers on Wall Street that there's places in the world that are more beautiful than Naples, Florida and Miami, Florida, and that San Diego, California wasn't the end-all, be-all. Uh, and so those are the great trips that people would go throughout America and say, wow, we got it all. And the problem with America is we think we have it all. And as all of you who travel the world know, we don't have it all. We have some good stuff, but we don't have it all. So we brought them to, and you can imagine, in 1987, when we announced to our stockbrokers that the incentive trip this year for the best producers in our company is going to Dubrovnik. And somebody said, well, where is that? We said, Yugoslavia. <laughs> it didn't go over very well. And people thought I was joking, that we're really going to take them to a communist country, and, that's what, and, and they were dumbfounded. So actually, they were so excited about the absurdity of what I proposed, we had a record year. And they came to Dubrovnik. And to this day, people talk about that was the most incredible trip they've ever been on to see a thousand-year-old city 
with all of its heritage and all of its history, still there intact. You know, we think we invented, you know, and that happens to societies that get strong. We think we invented everything in America. And I share with our friends in America, I said, well, uh, in 1416, the Republic of Dubrovnik outlawed the transportation of slaves on their ships because it was inhumane and wrong. 1460. If you look at, at the fort overlooking the old city, inscribed in the wall is our most important thing, is our liberty. That's the 14th century. So when we talk about liberty and, and America and so on, we may have roots elsewhere. In fact, I share with people that the word, the Potomac River, they think it's an Indian tribe, but there's a Croatian word, Potomac. Potomac is a word that means our next spirited generation. And if you hear stories about the fact that Dubrovnik was the first to recognize the United States of America as a country, they were looking for a society and a vision and people who believed in what they believed in. And so therefore, if you think about the word Potomac, maybe that's how the river got its name. We know that the pillars on the White House came from Croatia. So there's, there's some kind of a nice connection. And so somehow I feel kind of a little bit at home here when I came back to Dubrovnik. Uh, so I came back in 2000 thinking about my retirement. And of course, in 2000, I still had nine years to go. But one of the mistakes men make in particular is we actually don't think about retirement until it's too late. You wake up one day and say, oh my god, I'm 65 or I'm 70 years old, now what do I do? And you look around for some help and the men around you can't help you any more than you can help yourselves. And then you look at the women and they say, I've been trying to tell you that for 10 years. And you don't listen to me, you don't listen. You never listen. So we all struggle with that <laughs> as we go through our life. So I decided to be ahead of the game. And so I came here in 2000 with the idea that if Zinfandel wine actually originated in Croatia, what if I were to bring the wine from California, the vines, and actually start becoming a vintner here and become a winemaker when I retire someday? And I knew you needed lead time to, to do that. And so that's what I came to do. I uh, couldn't find any vineyard land, but I found a home that's actually, for those of you, if you look out that window, uh, that's my view because two, two properties down is where we actually have the house. Uh, at one time, it was known as the most popular bar in this part of the world, the Splendid Bar. Uh, it was a strip disco, so you can imagine why it was. It, it doesn't do that anymore. <laughs> and if you want to get excited, it's just me stripping to go to bed. So <laughs> it isn't very exciting, trust me. <laughs> so uh, the house was for sale, and I said, you know what? Uh, I think it's worth a shot. And I thought about it. It was very expensive at the time. And uh, I said, the downside is... I could lose half my money. And the, the issue I had at that point in time, if we go back to where I call myself maybe a pioneer, is Milosevic was still in power in Serbia. And the question was, was the civil war is over? Or is this thing going to boil back over again? You remember Kosovo had just ended. There was a lot of issues. We're going from the, the Clinton administration into the Bush administration. People weren't exactly sure what's happening in this region. And I said, worst case, I lose half my money. But you can't buy a view in a city like this. And that's the gamble I took back in 2000. Uh, it took me six years to complete the house. And I learned how to work here in Croatia under Croatian rules. And um, you have to understand, this is a country that, that probably for the modern time of the last 300 years, I would think the greatest influence came from the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. And they keep records. They keep records of everything. On one of my vineyards, we found the bunker and a little barracks that are all you know, old and destroyed. And in the War Museum in Vienna, it was built, it says, that piece of my property was built in 1823. It tells you what it looked like. It tells you who was there. It's all there in the records. We have records. And then they also said you need to have rules, strict rules. And in this country, there are really strict rules around how you do things. Keep in mind that in Dubrovnik, uh, in, in I think the 13th century, a lot of the homes were built out of wood. And they had a massive fire. They changed the building codes, the building codes. And they said, you can no longer build out of wood, you have to build out of stone. 
Well, they didn't have enough stone in the old city. And what they did for all the people selling their goods, they said you can come into the old city to sell your goods, but you'll now have to pay an entrance fee. Two stones. They collected millions of stones to build the houses again. That's how they got the stones to recreate the, the old city. The problem is part of the Stradun was filled in because it was like a bay right there and, and other parts were filled in. In 1667, when the earthquake came, people don't realize that when you do that, that the earth and what you filled in, unless you have deep piles drilled into the ground, will actually liquefy. And it did. And that's why so many people died in 1667, because the buildings literally collapsed on them. Since 1667, they've had earthquake building codes here in Dubrovnik. You have to live to those standards. So when you build here, every day there's work at my house here in Dubrovnik for six years. Don't cheat. And I tell you, it's very tempting. Somebody came every day, and I paid them to come every day to sign the book and says, this is what was done today, and everything is done according to rules. Now, you can say the person came and signed and didn't look. You can say whatever you want to say. The fact is, that's the rule. Now, if you want to pay somebody a little extra money, and maybe they don't come by every day, you can get yourself into trouble. And so part of the challenge for us is we build a home or you do a business here. The first one is understand the rules. Know that you will play by the rules. And in the end, anybody who says they can take care of it for you, and you think the government's taking graft, you're being stupid. Because most people have very little influence over the person who has control. And if you want to know, a little secret, if you want to know who has control, it's the person with the stamp. Whoever has the stamp, that's the person you got to find out what they want to go pshh, pshh, because they don't go pshh, until they are satisfied the rules. So you can go, this one says and that one says, but you got to know who has the stamp, what they require, and follow the rules. It'll take a long time, but you can get there. Uh, the other is I think about my experience here is that people are well intended. Uh, and you've got to make sure that you show some respect to the people that are here that are well-intended. They take great pride in what they do, and they just take longer to get there. Now, in addition to building my home, uh, I decided to buy some vineyard land, and I retired in 2006. And we built a vi one of, uh, two vineyards up, uh, one in Dingach on Peliashats, the other one is in Vegan uh, over on Peliashats, about two hours north of here. Uh, and there again, when you buy land here, you have to know what you're doing. You really have to know what you're doing. Uh, therefore, you have to understand the Book of Deeds, which are very complicated and antiquated. You have to understand how to research the Book of Deeds. Uh, the parcels that I had to buy were many little pieces because over many generations, you know, it goes to the, the sons, who goes to the sons, who goes to the sons. So you have all these little pieces of land. And if one son stayed in Croatia, the other one went to New Zealand, you got to get to New Zealand to find him. If one went to Australia, you got to find him. If one went to Chile, you got to find him. If you don't find him, and you buy the property, you're at risk of them coming back and there's no statute of limitations. And you have a new partner, even though you didn't think you were going to have a partner. So there, you've got to be real careful about how you do your analysis and, and so on. And I was fortunate, I have a wonderful lawyer, I have a wonderful business partner, and her family are helping me. In fact, her family uh, has bought their first land, and they've been producing wine for many years in Pelyashats. Uh, they bought their land in 1360. We now have the 29 managers, the 21st or 22nd generation of the family to make wine here in Croatia. So there are a lot of people who have strong roots and strong background. If you find them, work with them, uh, and you're patient, I think you could do some business here.